and uh, good afternoon. My name is Ann Woodliffe. I'm an attorney with a practice focus on specification sen uh, setting association. And I'm Seth Newberry. <clears throat> I've been the executive director for about 20 years for the Open Mobile Alliance. I've also been, uh, as Joy mentioned, one of the uh, founding directors uh, or founding executive director of the Joint Development Foundation. And also I'm the um, uh, co-founder of an organization called uh, Standards Hub, uh, which is a service organization that provides support services for standards projects. So um, anyway. So our goal today is to uh, talk about what standards organizations do, how successful ones are, are formed, and how they operate. For today's discussion, we're using the words standards and specifications interchangeably. So um, we tried to tailor this talk for the audience here because um, uh, this is a open source uh, developers conference and open source developers sort of go, I don't know what the big deal is about a standard. Uh, but, we, but standards and open source projects do share a lot of common DNA. But at the same time, um, there are a lot of differences. The, uh, uh, the standards uh, operate differently. They have different objectives. And so what we're trying to do for the benefit of this audience is to try to apply um, some of the simple um, practices associated with standards so that you as open source developers will um, be able to add, this, add the uh, concept of a standards project to your toolkit. Um, and hopefully at the end of our talk here, you'll have a little better idea of what it takes to set up or join a standards body and how it can be effective or an effective tool in collaboration with an open source uh, uh, software project. Great. Should we do the next? Thank you. So what does it do? Why have one? It's a neutral form for development of a, a technical standard where competitors may safely develop uh, technical solutions of mutual benefit. I like to focus on technical because you're not there to conspire in any way. <laughs> you're there to do technical uh, solutions. It ensures different implementations are able to work together seamlessly. It encourages widespread adoption for the benefit of the industry as a whole. It provides a potential on-ramp for that standard to become an international standard. It also provides a fair playing field. This is a term that's often used with these associations uh, to ensure that the standard is developed with transparent decision-making processes. And they're often intellectual property rights. These are referred to as IPR, associated with a standard. Companies which are members of the consortium and have contributed to the development of a standard may have patents related to the implementation of the standard. A well-run consortium helps to ensure that the IPR is properly de declared and is bound to the resulting standard. So when you complete a standard, what do you get? And well, you get the first part, which is the specification itself. Um, and that really is a pathway to implementation for a developer. Uh, so the specification is a roadmap. Uh, it, it, it helps developers produce the specification that meets the use cases and the requirements. <clears throat> the other thing you often get is uh, a, a test and implementation specification. So you want a standard is really there to provide for a pathway for interoperability. So that's what the, that's what the obvious pieces are. But below the surface is something that's absolutely more important in, in many cases. And that's the process. So the first thing is that you have a collaboration process because you're putting a bunch of engineers from competing companies uh, together and you're trying to reach a technical consensus. And there is an art to reaching technical consensus like that. <clears throat> you also have the benefit of antitrust protection because you have competitors in the room, you're sharing information, and uh, there are protections that are available within the confines of a standards body uh, that will help you um, allow you to uh, work together uh, without getting yourself into legal trouble. Probably one of the most important pieces is the IPR consistency, because even if you are creating a standard that is a royalty-free standard, one that does not, uh, where an implementer might, uh, might have the confidence that they don't, uh, uh, won't, will not have to pay royalty rents, or if, you, if you're making one that's a RAND standard where the uh, patent prote is, are protected, all of the, 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 the contribution integrity of the IPR is really important, and it's one of those things that's uh, central to a good standard. 
Again, I mentioned test and validation because there are gonna be performance standards, there's gonna be interoperability standards, and so you want to make sure that your standard uh, creates a test va and validation suite. And then finally, you have a community of interest that can maintain the standard because the standard does not exist in a certain period of time, they're forever. And if they're embedded in products, if they're embedded in networks, they need to be upgraded and maintained, and the standards body is the place where that happens. So this is a gross oversimplification, but stick with me because I'm gonna try. The, um, an open source project is different than a specification, but it has common, it, it has some similarities. But the, um, one of the features of an open source project is that you essentially end with what you start with. So you start with a repository with 100 lines of code and you end with a repository with 100,000 lines of code. But you have, you, you have essentially the same thing. Also, as you're progressing through an open source project, you can take a bind of the code and you can execute it. And if it does what you want, great. If it doesn't do what you want, you make, you make pull requests and you, ch and you can change the nature of what it does. Uh, the rules are relatively simple um, uh, for contribution. You're, you're, you're contributing source code. Uh, and it's usually under a license, uh, and that license is established usually within the uh, collaboration tool of the version control system. So if you've got a, a contributor license agreement in your GitHub repository, that takes a lot of the complexity out. So a, a fairly straightforward, logical progression. A specification isn't the same. You start with a bunch of ingredients and you end with a cake. It doesn't, it, 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 the thing you start with is not at all the thing you end with. And so the stages are quite different. Uh, let's say you want to create a specification for a transport protocol that can monitor and wake a device, transact with the device, and, uh, and the device itself, uh, it's, it's, so it's not chatty, so maybe the device can last on a D cell battery for 10 years, right? That's a problem statement that a standard is, is uh, intended to resolve. And so you, you, you start with a problem, and then that generates requirements. Those requirements generate use cases. Those use cases will uh, create a technical specification that, res that resolves the use cases, and you'll get a test specification, then you'll publish it. So the contributions that people make are oftentimes ideas. Uh, they can be code, but a lot of times they're just ideas. And those ideas may, con may contain uh, standards essential patents. And so those patents, as they apply to the specification, once, once they get into the specification stream, they get mixed into that pancake batter pretty fast and you can't pull them out, right? If you're in a, if you're in a open source project and somebody puts malicious code in or something like that, you can identify them, you can pull the code in and you can patch it. But once it's in a specification, it's much more difficult to take it out. So you, um, you've got to be a lot more careful and rigorous about how the contributions get made. Um, and so that tends to front end load a lot of what you do in a, in a specification project compared to an open source project. Well, we tried to put together some um, thoughts about what you need to consider <laughs> when you decide to uh, form or join a standards consortium. So as you can see, there is quite a lot to consider, and this is a fairly uh, complete checklist. So we're going to cover what we think are the uh, most important uh, bits of information in our limited time today, and um, we look forward to any questions that you may have later. Regarding this list, memorize it. No, <laughs> So there are different types of standards bodies, and you may be familiar with some of these names, but we just wanted to give you a concept. It, the International Organization for Standardization is called ISO, and it provides organizations with guidelines for uni universally recognized standards. There's also, uh, countries go into ISO, and um, this is the national standards bodies in different countries that go in. And so uh, the one for the United States is ANSI, is American National Standards Institute, and is the sole representative and full member of ISO. So what we're talking about today, though, are uh, standards developing organizations. They're industry or sec sector-based, and they develop and publish industry-specific standards. 
whether you're part of a group thinking about starting a, a new consortium or if you're evaluating whether to join an existing one, you'll want to understand the following. The scope and mission of the consortium, often stated as the purpose of the organization and the bylaws, will have a fundamental impact on the contribution of the IPR to the project. For example, if your purpose is to define a toaster oven and the project winds up defining a microwave oven, then it's likely the IPR licensing commitments uh, from the contributors will not be valid. Are there different types of membership levels with varying rights, and are, are these clearly stated at the time of formation? The founders should define the financial needs uh, of the project before they incorporate. How will the project be funded? What kind of support will the project require? F founders are giving control of the project to a collective. Standards consortia are not governed top down like a corporation. It's important to understand this, this dynamic before uh, committing to the consortium project. It's difficult to limit, limit who participates in the project once it's established. It becomes a party where everyone is on the guest list. Other questions to consider. Is there a clear policy defining IPR commitments? FRAND, which is known in Europe as, and here in the United States is RAND, and that stands for, in your fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, also in the U.S., RAND is fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, royalty-free or hybrid, and once defined, changes to the IPR policies are usually very hard to make, so you want to think about it very carefully up front. How is the project stru structured for governance? For example, how do the technical working groups fit into the governance structure? How is the standard approved? Is the standard publicly available? How are the directors elected? Are there tight controls related to the membership obligations, such as paying dues, antitrust compliance, and IPR compliance? Being consistent with a well-drafted process is essential to a successful standard. A standards consortium is a company. It usually collects money from its members to support operations. It's often registered with the state of incorporation and must conform to specific requirements of that state. It will need accounting, invoicing, collections, banking, and tax filings. These functions need solid controls. It's formed as an, if, it's, if it is formed as a nonprofit, it must conform to nonprofit law. Who's running the day to day operations? Will this be done by employees or a management company that acts as an independent contractor? If formed as a corporation, it must have a board of directors. It will also likely have a steering committee or some kind of management structure that approves and oversees its operations. It should have independent legal counsel, although for some smaller consortia, uh, there might be a, a legal committee, usually made up of in-house counsel from some of the member companies. Members have full-time jobs elsewhere and are not expected to run the day-to-day -day operations of a standards body. It takes a lot of time. Uh, you might remember that list, um, <laughs> the laundry list. For a consortium to be successful, it must have qualified help to run its operations, and this cost should be taken into account when setting the membership dues and building the first budget. This should be done before you form the company, the consortium. So um, before I step to the next slide, one of the things I want to do, we talked about the uh, standards bodies that are available uh, the uh, couple of slides ago, um, the ISO. The, um, um, the national standards bodies and so forth. One of the uh, advantages that you have in, in joining a standards uh, working group in one of those is that they have an established process, right? So you're, you're essentially inheriting whatever is there. But in a lot of cases, uh, if you have a, an, an interesting idea or a new standard that you want to pr uh, uh, propose, you're not going to be able to get into their work program. Right, because they have a very established set of, of, of uh, working groups or technical committees, and you're, you're going to have a very difficult time getting in. So if you've got something novel that you want to try, and, you want, and you've got a, a group of a few companies that want to try it, a consortium, which is what we're really focused on here, is a really good way to go, because you can customize what you're doing, how you do it, 
and what your um, uh, process rules and IPR rules are to um, the to the um, best outcome that you want out of that group. So within that framework, what we're now talking about are uh, when you've created this new consortium, the goal of that specification project is really exclusively the purpose of developing and gaining adoption of that specification that you're working on. And so the working groups are the engine room of any specification project. And um, there are a few things that you really have to consider when you're, um, um, uh, when you're uh, uh, hosting a working group. And that is transparent decision making uh, procedures for all of the contributors. Um, because there are no sort of, if you will, senior people in a working group. Everybody who participates has the right to participate, has the right to be heard, has the right to their, uh, make their contr contributions to it. Um, the other thing that you have to have, you need version control systems uh, because you're creating something that everybody has to know what it is at any given moment in time. And you need a consensus process that says, uh, we agree on whatever it is that this version is as a group. Now, I would also say that consensus does not always mean uh, agreement. You're not, you don't have to love what you have. You have to be able to live with what you create. And so uh, consensus is uh, not unanimity. Uh, it's, it's usually hard fought, and you get, you get what you can, uh, and as long as everybody can live with it, that's consensus. The other piece that's really important is capable and well-trained leadership because the, um, the working group chairs are key to running these, these organizations. So there's actually a pretty natural roadmap in running a specification. And so one of the things you really want to avoid is going out and creating your own custom process. Don't do it. The industry is taking care of this problem for you. Um, and, but you have, but there are going to be shades of how you do it. Because if, let's, let's assume that you have a specification that has 30 companies participating in three different continents. That is going to drive how you run the working group. Because um, you're going to drive, you're, you're suddenly dealing with time zone issues, language issues, those sorts of things, and that's going to that's going to have a big impact on how you structure the consortium. So, um, as I say, the actual work, the pr the product you produce, goes through a very sp consistent requirements, use cases, specification development, test case, validation, and then a draft approval, and then a final approval, and then publication. So the, that's the roadmap that you're on. But how you execute that roadmap is really important, depending upon the nature of, of, your, of, your, um, of your participation. So as I mentioned, uh, if you have an important specification, it will be an international specification. That's just, that's just part of the deal. Uh, because you're, you're not going to have a widely adopted specification if it's just regional. You may, it may be fine for the United States. It may be fine for Europe. But if, if you're getting something that's going to have worldwide adoption, you have to have all of the players in, involved. And so what that tends to do for you is it pushes you into kind of asynchronous decision making, right? So things like using um, a GitHub repository are a really good and effective way of running your working group because then each proposal just becomes a pull request. You have a review and approval period and you have the uh, 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 ultimately adoption of that, and it gets baked into the baseline. But um, uh, but you but that you you need to know that before you start, because if you if you haven't thought that through, you're going to spend a lot of time, and you're going to have a lot of engineers saying, "Oh, I want to do it this way, or I want to do it that way," and you're going to get a lot of not invented here, and it's just going to um, delay actual implementation of, the, uh, of getting the work done. The other one really is the contribution process. You've got to be very careful. People who bring contributions in are bringing intellectual property in. Um, even if it's a, a, a royalty-free specification, 
that intellectual pro property is still, it's still present. And so your licensing um, um, uh, choices that you make when you form the, specific, uh, the standards body have to be enforced at the working group level. And you don't want to have people coming in um, from the outside, hey, I got a friend who's got a really good idea. He wants to make a presentation. That is a really bad idea because that's a great way of importing foreign IPR that at some other date is going to cause you problems. So one of the things I talked about here is uh, transparency of the decision making. And I want to, uh, this is as deep as I'm going to dig into, the, into this, process, into this uh, topic, but it's, it's worth understanding and thinking about. So the version control um, uh, and notice period uh, of contributions are really cornerstones to transparent decision making. So let's assume here that you've got, you're in the requirements phase, an Acme company says, I want to add a requirement to the, um, to the specification. And let's assume, too, that it's kind of a controversial requirement. Not everybody agrees. So one of the things that will happen is that Acme will socially, you know, so, will, will informally socialize their idea. And, and people will say, yeah, I, 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 I'd consider that. But then at that point, and, and, and I tell you, I've seen this happen so much, where somebody says, well, send an email and we'll, we'll, we'll approve it over email. No. An email is a living document. You need a static, version-controlled, written contribution made either to the repository or to the portal. And that, that contribution is a formal proposal to add requirement X to the, to the specification. There needs to be like a 7 to 14 day review period because, again, if you're thinking about international, people need to be able to have time to review it. They may not they may actually need to move it up the ladder in their own corporation. They may need to translate it. So there's, there's a process of, of time required in order to make the specification, uh, uh, allow people to review the specification. Then there's a, usually there's a review and approval. There may be a vote or a consensus. Are there any objections to adding ACME's uh, uh, um, uh, uh, proposal? And if that's approved, then it can be it can be merged into the baseline document. If it's not, then there's a negotiation process. And essentially, this cycle goes until pr the uh, proposal is adopted or rejected. So the important part about all this is that, that following that process gives you an unimpeachable uh, record that says we um, allowed for full transparency, we allowed for everybody to participate, and it prevents future assertions of exclusionary process down the road. Because eventually somebody, if you have a popular specification, somebody's going to troll that specification. And when they do that, they'll, they may use process issues to say, oh, wait, you didn't do it right. And so uh, uh, applying these kinds of process specifics to your program really protects the specification in the long run. It protects the consortium because they're, you know, the consortium can have a problem. And it protects the people who make the contribution. Well, you know, you listen to all this and you think, is this really, does this really matter? I mean, why does this really matter? Are there really uh, real life examples of why this matters? Well, I think there's at least one person in the room that could probably speak on this subject for uh, several days, um, <laughs> David Rudin. Uh, the failure to disclose a patent is one example. And uh, this is where a patent holder does not disclose its patent while participating in the consortium that creates the specification and then later demands high royalties. This leads to patent infringement, uh, litigation by the companies implementing the standard, and it, vague procedures may also implicate the uh, consortium itself. So this is uh, of concern. We could... As I said, we could go into this for quite a while, but we will leave it at, yes, it matters, and they're real life examples. <laughs> so here's another, another example uh, is, is with the, I have lots of notes on the other, I guess I was really ready to go into telling you all the legal, <laughs> as the exclusion of a, a company's technology in a standard. So if companies conspire 
And that means uh, two or more companies get together and they want to exclude the technology of a competitor from the specification, then there may be litigation against these companies and the consortium itself. The decision not to adopt an outdated technology, however, is not the same as an explicit understanding to conspire. These are uh, cases. So, you know, we, we, we've given you a long list of things you have to worry about. We've talked a lot about process and probably um, caused you all to say, wow, I don't ever want to do a standard if I can avoid it. Uh, so that's a lot to consider. But really, this is very well-worn uh, territory, and there's a lot of good advice uh, to help you if you decide to start a consortium. So you're not alone. Help is available. Uh, a couple of places to really look here are, uh, if you are part of a company that is active in standards, you're going to have in-house counsel that knows a, a lot about this, and that's your first stop. Um, if you are in a smaller company, or maybe they're not involved as much in standards making, uh, there are specialist legal practitioners that are out there that could help you in the same way that um, an in-house counsel could. There are also some association management companies uh, that, are, that are available to help you uh, establish a, a, a new standards consortium. However, be cautious about that because you don't necessarily want a, a, an association management company that only does the American Popcorn Association uh, when you're trying to create a standard around quantum computing. So you want somebody who knows what standards are about and who's dealt with those kinds of uh, uh, um, technical associations. The Joint Development Foundation, uh, and Jory's going to come in and talk, I think, a bit about that as well, is a really great place to start. It's, it's one of the, it's one of the um, programs within the Linux Foundation that is standards focused. Uh, they've got a whole program, uh, so that's a really easy place to get started. And, and I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say that Standards Hub can also help you. So if you're not, if, if you're, for whatever reason, uh, not inclined to use the Joint Development Foundation, give us a call. We'll, we'll be happy to give you some advice. So just wrapping this up, a standards project is a big investment. So have a really clear vision of where you want to end up. Uh, and then invest time prior to formation. This is one of those places where uh, doing your requirements and doing your homework first uh, makes a big difference. I've seen people rush to formation and then spend a year uh, fooling around with the process. Uh, remember that when, you're, when you join a standards body, you're giving control of the project to the members and you're losing a measure of autonomy over the project. So that, um, that's, that's a really important um, um, uh, principle. Uh, and as a result, the specification that you get out of a broadly based standards consortia is going to be more well adopted. Get help, get professional support. Avoid known pitfalls, don't make it up on your own. This is, this, this is not a creative enterprise. Uh, do, <laughs> and, and get the help so you can support your volunteers because it's a lot of work. Um, good governance and procedures protect the consortium, protect the members, and they protect the specification in the future. They are very important. Um, and then, Having a well-run and well-formed specification uh, is actually a, an on-ramp to a national standards body. Um, at the Linux Foundation, the Joint Development Foundation is a past submitter, which means that they can uh, um, matriculate uh, specifications into ISO. Uh, there are other past project uh, programs for uh, Etsy, for ANSI. So there, there are other ways of making the specifications move from your your tight little consortium into a much more um, um, uh, uh, well-recognized international standards body, which really can add a lot of gravitas to the, to the importance of your spec. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you both so much. Um, they did leave ample time for Q&A. Um, I realize, like, you know, that can be hard to ask. Dave's been our champ for the first first queue. I wonder, Seth, if you want to pop back actually to that that laundry list. Oh, there you go. Uh, the laundry list is epic. Um, 
and um, <laughs> kind of overwhelming a little bit, right? Even for someone who's who's seen seen this list a lot. Um, I wonder if um, we want to maybe talk about some of the the pieces on here that you feel might be most um, salient, particularly for our open source communities, which are you mentioned don't just go get started. Well, a lot of times in open source, we just go, we just open up a repo and off we off we run. Um, but there's some thoughtfulness and some um, pre-work, if you will. Um, from our wonderful laundry list here, are, are there some things that you would really advise our open sorcerers out there to consider investing in first? That's my first question to you. Do you want right. to? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Mm -hmm. So, um, so let's use the sort of the example you gave, which is we've got a bunch of open sourcers there. They, they said, why don't we just open a repo and do it? Well, actually, opening a repo and doing it is, is, a, is a really good first step because the repo itself provides a certain amount of uh, uh, governance in, it, in and of itself. Now, that's great, but you still have to know, I think, the, the, the couple of important things is, what are you doing about the intellectual property and the copyrights? Um, and do you intend to own anything in common with the, as you, as you do this, right? So, uh, do you intend to have support for it? Do you intend to essentially kind of own the copyrights at that point? when you have ownership or you've got money going around, you really need to form a body that's a legal entity around that. So you can do that through a JDF project with one of their series, or you can go off and you can establish uh, a nonprofit of your own uh, in the consortium. But if you establish your own nonprofit, you own it. And that means you've got to file your Form 990s to the government every year, you've got to get a bank account. And where do I get a bank account? How do I do all that sort of thing? And then I have to pay, um, you know, my state filing fees and all those sorts of things. So it's easy to get started easily. Um, and in a lot of times, you don't need a standards body. You, you, you absolutely, if you just got three or four people that want to put an idea together that is confined to their particular needs, Go get a GitHub repo and, and an MOU and start. But the minute you move beyond that, the minute you add the fourth or fifth person into the group, now all of a sudden you've got conveyance of IP. Uh, and, and so that m now creates a much more complicated situation if, in fact, your little three-person group expands to anything bigger. And you had um, pointed out uh, almost offhandedly, but I think it was really important um, how the scope of the project yeah. really matters. And I think that's another big difference between a lot of open source projects. They don't necessarily have like a scope or a charter. Can you speak to maybe, you know, put a finer point on, on why that's so important? Yeah, happy to do so. As I noted, particularly if it's an incorporated entity, there'll be bylaws, there'll be articles of association bylaws, and there'll be a purpose. And so the, the group will, over the years, come back to that purpose and look at that purpose as they consider the the members of the consortium that are coming into the consortium, and as they consider particularly as I, I stated in the presentation, the IPR commitments, the intellectual property rights commitments, because you'll, you'll want to be focused on uh, what the purpose of the organization is as, you, uh, as, as the groups join together, the working groups that Seth talked about come together, and then they're, they, they know the direction they're going in, and so you're not just going this way and that way all over. Actually, we had a great example of, of why the scope was important um, in, in one of the work, one of the uh, groups I supported, where uh, a large company hit, who had a lot of patents said, "We want to participate, uh, and we want to participate in that working group, and we're and we're going to commit our IP to that, 
but the scope of that working group limits the um, uh, purpose of uh, the use of and uh, of the licenses that they had. So we had a RAND license, and they said, well, as long as it's we're willing to license against this scope, but if you go over here and try to use my RAND license here in another project that has a different scope, you can't. And so that protection uh, or that, that limitation of the application of their IP was very important to them and they were, and they were comfortable to, uh, to participate in that. But, um, and the fact that you had an established scope meant that somebody couldn't take that IP and use it in some other way that wouldn't have been appropriate to their RAND license. And you called the working groups like the engines of a of a standards org, and I think that's so um, that's such a good description. Um, and then talking about how important the the scope is, I think the the question is, um, what kind of training? You know, how important is it for your for for these participants to really know those documents? Do you see that being you know an obstacle or an opportunity or a potential pitfall for? Standards well, I think that the um, ha under, understanding what you're doing and having good chairs is really important. We've got a great example at um, JDF in C2PA, right? There, that was a group, pretty small group. Uh, I, I remember probably seven or eight companies involved, but they really knew what they were doing. They'd all been experienced. Uh, they were really decision focused, and they got a specification from zero to done in about nine months, which is a land speed record uh, for that. And that's just because they were folk, they, they didn't try to invent anything new. They all understood the process. They read a pro they, they adopted a process. They said, this is what we're gonna use. And boom, they, they were really, they were great. On the other hand, you see people who will spend a lot of time trying to fine tune the process and they will spend a year doing that in which case the technical work isn't happening. And the problem is if you go to your manager and, and say, we want to renew our membership in XYZ and you haven't done anything, XYZ is not going to prosper. And I would add that uh, the training is extremely important as it relates to uh, the intellectual property rights and antitrust compliance, and sometimes the trademark compliance if you have a certification body. And that's, uh, it, it helps groups, it, it goes in, if you go in and give a general training, it helps the organization as a whole. And then for the board of directors of a, a, an organization, you really need to give training related to fiduciary duties because they have certain duties that are uh, bound under law. Uh, one is, for instance, to be sure that they read the materials and understand what's going on. And, and um, so there's a lot that, of training that is needed for these organizations um, and ongoing I would say because people come in and go out so maybe once a year training is good other qu oh yeah Elizabeth yeah <laughs> thank you hi thank you very much it was very interesting and I wish I had that laundry list uh, four years and a half ago <laughs> 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 would have been a send us an email, we'll send it to you. <laughs> yeah. um, so I work for Mobility Data, we're the nonprofit organization uh, stewarding the standard GTFS and GBFS, which are for travel information, um, uh, it's a travel information standard. Um, quick question, so currently we're a nonprofit, we're already established, we do business in Canada and in the US in terms of hiring and in France. Um, and our standard is being used everywhere in the world. Uh, but as we're you know, thinking of new projects and new, for example, a certification, that's something that we're thinking of. Is the working group like welcoming some already well-established organization that has a standard that is already working well, or specification working well and being used everywhere in the world? Um, or you, it's usually composed of stakeholders that are at the very early stage. So I'm, I'm not sure I understood quite the question, partially because the speakers are pointed toward us. Um, but it's, it, it, uh, uh, if I understood your question, you, if you have an existing organization that's already yep. working well, 
create a new working group within that organization because that's, you, you've got a culture, yeah. you've, got, you've already got the knowledge base there, create a new working group within it, and, and, um, and chances are you're gonna be very successful with that. But I'm not quite sure that's the question you asked me. Half of the half of the answer, half of the question. I thought I'm questioning if, let's say, we want to build a new program that is. I, I agree. Like within the company, we're able to build that program and host a working group. But let's say that we want to um, share and collaborate with other people, maybe from the working group, to establish a new program that is currently not not existing in the company. Is that something that um, you do with that working group approach? And, and uh, let me just ask Go this. Ahead. Are you saying in the company, meaning your own company? Or you I mean the organization. The sorry. organization, no, oh. the yeah, consortium yeah, yeah. itself. Yeah. Yeah, I would just say that if you're, and you're thinking about having a certification part of yes. that. And, and then you probably, under your membership agreement, you probably have something in there that says, hey, we're going to create new policies from time to time. And you're bound to of the course. new policies, of course. Yeah. yeah. And so then you'll want to have the, the trademark licensing, uh, it, particularly with the certification mark in place for everybody. And then, but to your specific question, I believe that you could take the information from one working group you know, because you're still within the consortium itself, yeah. right? And then set it up, and they, they then decide how this certification part is going to occur. I don't yeah. see an issue with that. Do you? No, it, de it somewhat depends on how your organization was formed in the first place. So most of the um, standards bodies that I've been involved with, it's kind of an all-you-can-eat buffet. So you, you, you join, and then if you create new working groups, people are able to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. participate in them. But not all of them are structured that way because sometimes people who are working over here in this working group don't want to worry about patent encumbrances that they might or, or, or having to, uh, be, because you don't want this working group over here to make a decision that you weren't aware of where you might actually be required to license your IP over here and you weren't participating. So depending on how the working groups are set up, uh, there are ways of um, siloing the company's um, responsibilities within a particular working group. Okay. Um, but again, the fact that you have, if you have a governance structure that is working, work within that governance structure because it's a lot easier than creating a new thing over yeah. here. Also, you've got, you've already got a treasury, you've got a membership management right. model, all that sort of stuff. So, so all of that. yeah. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to do any of that. No. <laughs> right. Well, maybe a Great. few of these. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. All right. Other questions for Seth and Ann about the laundry list or anything <laughs> else? Okay, great. Well, um, thank you both so much for, for your time and for sharing your knowledge. And um, this will laundry list is up on the slides sketch thing already in case you <laughs> thank you thank you Jory. thank you